We're coming on the air right now with breaking news. We begin with that breaking news, a state of emergency in California. A deadly mass shooting. And after a bizarre rampage turned deadly on Burke Street. I saw people running and screaming. As the bunch. <laughs> Hello. Hi, it's great to see you guys. It's been a while. Um, yeah, like Dave said, my name's Jay, and uh, I'm, uh, I serve over the hill in Santa Cruz at a church called Vintage Faith Church, but um, uh, I've been there for about two and a half years, but for two and a half years before that, I was a part of the team here at Westgate. And um, so, you know, honestly, it feels a little bit like I graduated high school, went off to college, and am coming home for the holidays. So <laughs> thanks, for, thanks, Mom and Dad, for letting me be home just for a week. And uh, seriously, it's really good to see you, everybody in the theater and over at South Hills. Hello. Uh, I wish I could be with you in person. I miss you guys. Um, so glad all of you are here. Let's jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> about 300 years before the birth of Jesus, uh, there was a man that most of you know, a Greek philosopher by the name of Aristotle. And Aristotle was an incredibly influential voice, continued to be for hundreds and hundreds of years, is still influential in some ways today. Uh, but one of the ideas that he proposed was a fancy word called geocentrism. All that basically means is he proposed the idea that the earth is at the center of the universe and that the sun and the stars and all of the other planets orbit around us. And this idea became so popular, it became indoctrinated into the dominant worldview um, for well over a thousand years. Until another man, this guy, Nicholas Copernicus, came along. And in the year 1543, he declared that Aristotle was wrong. He said, the earth is actually not at the center of the universe. In fact, the earth is not even at the center of our own solar system. But instead, he proposed an idea, a fancy word called heliocentrism. And the idea is that in fact, in our solar system, the sun is at the center and the earth, along with several other planets, orbit around the sun, not the other way around. Now, um, the very few people who supported Copernicus's idea were punished, uh, even executed in some cases. And then, less than 100 years later, this guy, an Italian astronomer by the name of Galileo, looked through his telescope up at the night sky, and he saw the planet Jupiter in our solar system, and he noticed that there were several moons that were orbiting around Jupiter and declared that, again, Aristotle was wrong. That the solar system, the planets and the stars do not revolve around us. They do not orbit around the earth. That the earth is in fact not at the center of the, of the solar system, much less the galaxy. Now, you're all wondering, like, okay, it's been two and a half years since you were last here and you're going to start with the science history lesson. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Like, what's up with that, right? Here, there's a reason. And the reason is this, I want to ask a very simple question that's going to frame the rest of our time together this morning. And the question is this, how can people see that which so many others cannot see? How does that happen? I mean, think about it. Everybody, for the entirety of human history, we have all been standing on the same earth, looking up at the same sky, at the same sun and the same stars, and the vast majority of people for the vast majority of human history believed that we were at the center of it all. Except guys like Copernicus and Galileo somehow saw the truth when everyone else missed it. How does that happen? You know, every December, 
like we're in right now, as we plunge ourselves headlong into the holiday season, we are surrounded by the sights and sounds of Christmas. We see and we hear Christmas all around us. And the overwhelming majority of people on the planet, and in fact, the overwhelming majority of us, believe that Christmas, we may not verbalize it, but at our core, we believe that Christmas is about us. Like Aristotle, we believe that this season is meant to orbit around us. It's about our opportunity to find a little bit of rest and relaxation from the daily grind of the nine to five. It's about our opportunity to manufacture some experiences and some environments that might cultivate a little bit of peace, maybe a little bit of joy. It's about our opportunity, sadly to say, it's about our opportunity to consume. We may not verbalize it, but at our core, what we believe through our actions, through our mindset, through our approach to Christmas is that this season is about us, that it orbits around us. And yet there are some who have seen a deeper, significantly more hopeful truth, that the Christmas season is in fact not primarily about us that it does not orbit around us, that we are not at the center of that which we celebrate in this season. So the question today is again, how can we become the sort of people who see that which so many others cannot see? And in turn, how can we become the sort of people who then help others to see that which so many do not see? In order to answer that question, we should begin with this question. How did they first see? How did they first see? Last week here at Westgate, we jumped into a series uh, in the book of the New Testament that we call Luke, the gospel according to Luke. The word gospel is just a fancy word that simply means the good news. And so Luke is a story, the good news story of Jesus according to the writer Luke. And as we jumped in into chapter one, uh, what we saw was this is going to be a big, epic, sweeping story, which is why here at Westgate, you all are gonna journey through this book for several months. But we wanna land at the beginning of the story one more time today. In the beginning of the story, in Luke chapter one, what we discover is um, a man named Zechariah. Zechariah is a Jewish priest, uh, and he and his wife Elizabeth are elderly. They're in their later years. And the story tells us that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of God. What that means is that Zechariah and Elizabeth were um, faithful to the Lord. They loved God, and they centered their life around him and his promises and the hope that they believed he would someday bring. But Zachariah and Elizabeth, in their older age, had no children. And some of us in this room have felt the, the bitter sting of infertility. We know how painful that can be. I was just talking to someone here at the 640 uh, service last night who was sharing with me her journey. And it can be really painful. Here's what you need to know. For Zechariah and Elizabeth, as um, good, God-fearing Jews living in the first century ancient Jewish world, having no children was a big deal. It was a source of public shame, and it was a source of personal pain for them. And then one day, an angel arrives, an angel named Gabriel, and he shows up, and he says to Zechariah and Elizabeth, he says to them, listen, this is going to sound crazy to you, but you guys are going to have a kid. And he's going to be a, a, a little boy. And then Gabriel the angel says to Zachariah and Elizabeth, you are going to name this boy John. Now, why does this matter? If you've read the Bible, you've noticed time and time again, there are these moments where God promises a child and every single time God names the child. Why? You know, in our culture today, in 2018, late modern world here in the West, names are important, right? My wife and I just um, gave birth. My wife gave birth. I was just there. But you know what I'm saying. Like, we had another kid. Uh, I was a small part of that story. My wife did the work. But we had our second child about five months ago. And I remember in the months leading up to that moment of his birth, we were stressing about the name. 
Because names are important. You've done this too if you have kids, right? Names are important. They're gonna set the trajectory in some ways for their entire life. You're asking questions like, okay, what are all the terrible words that rhyme with this name? Because that's gonna happen in elementary school, right? So you're coming up with these names with like seven syllables and you're like, okay, nothing rhymes with that. That's great. As important as names are in our world today, in the ancient Jewish world, names were exponentially more important. Let me me show you. One contemporary rabbi um, says this, in Jewish tradition, names represent their vision of the future and the spark of hope for redemption. Pay attention to that. Vision for the future and the spark of hope for redemption. That's why Jews always placed great emphasis on naming a child, for in that name, there lay the history and the past of the family and the hopes and blessings for life. I know of nothing that so deeply touches a family's nerve system as the naming of a child. And so when the angel Gabriel arrives on the scene and says to Zachariah and Elizabeth, you are going to have a son and you are going to give him this particular name, this is infused with incredible meaning. The angel is essentially telling Zachariah and Elizabeth, God has a story to tell. He is going to tell that story through this child and the name of this child will tell you all about that story. And so what is the name? His name is John, which means God is gracious and has shown us favor. And so the angel arrives on the scene, tells this elderly couple, you're going to miraculously have a child, and that child's name is to be John. That child's name is going to remind you, your family, and your people that God's grace has not left you, that his favor is still upon you. And then the angel tells Zechariah, oh, also, side note, until this promise is fulfilled, uh, you're going to go mute. You're not going to be able to speak. That's how the story goes. And Zechariah goes mute. He can't speak, can't talk anymore. And then nine months later, this happens. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, it's Jewish tradition, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah, but his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Okay, so think about this. They were going to name John the Baptist after his father. We were this close, you guys, to having Junior the Baptist. Just think about that, how just un like how lame that would have been, right? Junior the Baptist, that was almost his name, except his mother said, no, 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 his name is John. And then they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. This is really funny to me because the story tells us that Zachariah is mute, not deaf, so he can hear, and yet they make signs to him. You gotta wonder if Zachariah was like, "Uh, dude, I can totally hear you, why are you signing? Like, I just can't talk, I can hear, you know? It's very odd, very rude, but that's what they do. They make signs to him, he's like, okay, whatever. And then he says, give me a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, Zachariah writes, his name is John. And the moment that Zachariah, John the Baptist's father, writes his name, immediately his mouth was open, his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And so Zechariah and Elizabeth say, no, 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 no. This newborn child, his name is John. And remember what names are. Names are a vision for the future, a spark of hope for redemption. And so when they are about to name this child, when they are about to declare what this child's life is going to proclaim to the world, Zechariah, his father, says, my son's name is God. God is gracious and has shown us favor. Zechariah says this child, his life, is going to bring to bear this reminder that God's grace has not left us, that his favor is still upon us. And then, filled with the Holy Spirit, Zechariah begins to prophesy over his son. And he says this, 
You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which, and pay attention, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide their feet into the path of peace. And so Zechariah's mouth is opened as he declares that his son's name is John, that God is gracious and has shown us favor. And the first words out of his mouth are these, this incredible prophetic message about his son, that his son will bring to bear the, the, the coming of one who will come as the rising sun who will come from heaven to shine light into our darkness against the shadow of death and to guide his people on the path of peace, this incredibly epic, beautiful prophetic word. And then when you fast forward to John the Baptist's actual life, what you begin to see is that John the Baptist does exactly that. He brings that message to God's people. This is Luke chapter three. This is about John as an adult. And it says this, he, John the Baptist, went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, the straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. These words from the Gospel of Luke that describe John the Baptist's work are a direct quote from an ancient prophetic book that we call Isaiah. And the original text from Isaiah says this um, in verse uh, chapter 40 of Isaiah. It's almost a word for word of Luke 3, 5, that when this king arrives, every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, crooked roads become straight, rough ways smooth. Okay, let me explain something. This is crucially important. This phrase that you are looking at in Luke, which is a quotation from an ancient book called Isaiah, that every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, that crooked roads shall become straight and rough ways smooth. This isn't just poetic language that, that Isaiah and then eventually Luke just came up with. It isn't random. This is actually phraseology. It was a phrase that was really common in the ancient world to describe and proclaim that a king was arriving. So not just in like the Jewish world or the Christian world, but in all of the ancient world, when a king, when royalty was about to, to take a journey to a particular place, that particular place, they would proclaim, okay, we need every valley needs to be filled in. Every hill and mountain needs to be made low. Make the crooked road straight and make the rough way smooth because a king is coming. Sometimes this was a phrase that was taken literally. They would actually um, adjust the natural terrain. Often it was language that was simply used as a metaphorical proclamation. But what is undeniable is that this phrase is a phrase in the ancient world that is always used to proclaim a king is on the way. And so why does Luke, in telling John the Baptist's story, quote this, these ancient words from Isaiah? Because John's life, the work of his life, his ministry is focused on one thing. John saw that which no one else saw before him, and he declares what he saw to the people of God, that a king is on the way. This is such immense hope for us because as much as we like to believe that the Christmas season is about us, that it orbits around us, 
As much as we like to believe that if we can just manufacture or create or cultivate just the right environment or just the right experience or just the right sort of life, just as much, as much as we like to believe that if we can just achieve the right amount of things, if we can have the right amount of things, if we can consume the right amount of things, that we can create the sort of peace and joy we are longing for, the story of John the Baptist, the word words of Isaiah declare emphatically to us that the peace and the joy that every human is longing for will not be realized or actualized until the king arrives. Tim Keller says it this way, that the message of Christianity is this. Things really are this bad. We can't heal or save ourselves. Things really are this dark. Nevertheless, there is hope. The Christmas message is that on those living in the land of shadow, a light has dawned. Notice that it doesn't say, from the world a light has sprung. But upon the world, a light has dawned. It has come from outside. There is light outside of this world, and Jesus has come from it to save us. Here's what's really powerful. What John the Baptist saw, what he declared with his life, this message of hope that a light was coming, that a king was on the way, was not just a message for himself or for his family or even just for his people, the Jewish people. Instead, what we see in Luke 3 is that it was a message for all people. That the hope is that all people will see God's salvation. The new vision of the future that John came to proclaim was a message of hope for all people. And it was and it continues to be missional and evangelistic in nature. Those are fancy Christian words to simply mean that this message of hope is a message designed to be shared. What it means is that if you have seen the great light, if you have experienced the truth that this king is on the way to make all wrong things right and to lead us down the path of peace, if that is a reality in your life, then that reality is in you, not just for you. It is in you to be shared with all people. In the way you live, in the way you speak, in the way you serve, in the way you give, in the way you include, the way you embrace, the way you give of yourself. Your life is designed to share this message of hope with all people. Charles Spurgeon once said this, that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Ouch. But true. So what does this all mean? How is any of this connected to the Christmas story? You remember the words of Zechariah back in chapter one as he is prophesying over his newborn son? In chapter one, he said that his newborn son, John, would bring a message proclaiming that the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Isaiah is actually quoting and in some ways paraphrasing a really well-known passage, again, from the ancient book of Isaiah. He is paraphrasing this verse, Isaiah 9-2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, good Orthodox Jews to this very day, and certainly at the time of Zechariah, when he spoke these words, the people in that home, hearing these words prophesied over the birth of this newborn son, John the Baptist, they would have known even though Zechariah doesn't continue to quote the passage, they would have known exactly what this passage was, that it's a Christmas passage. Because if you continue reading Isaiah chapter nine, what you see is this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, 
And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The story of John the Baptist is an indelible part of the Christmas story. The message of John the Baptist's life, his entire life's work, was the work of declaring and proclaiming to the world that a king was on the way. That although the world could not see in their hopelessness and in their despair, John the Baptist saw that which others could not see and he gave, literally gave his life to proclaim that truth to help people who could not see, see that a light was about to break through into the darkness, that a king was on the way to set our feet on the path of peace, to make all wrong things right, to heal the brokenness of our lives and our world. You've seen throughout this teaching how much Luke calls back to the words, these ancient words of Isaiah. Here's what you need to know. The words that Isaiah spoke were spoken almost 800 years before John the Baptist. Almost 800 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And in fact, for the, for the Jewish people, for God's people, The last prophet through whom God ever spoke was 400 years before John the Baptist. 400 years before the birth of Christ. You can imagine the sort of desperation and longing and confusion and doubt and anxiety that was embedded in the heart of God's people when Christ came. The questions like, will God ever speak again? Is God still for us? Is God still gracious to us? Is God's favor still upon us? Does God still consider us his people? Does God still care? Is God still around? Does God know what we're going through? Does God feel my pain and my hurt and my anxiety and my guilt and my shame? Does this sound familiar? Because you may not have been waiting 400 years, but maybe you've been waiting 40. Maybe almost your entire life you've been told that God loves you, but everything that life has thrown your way tells you otherwise. Maybe the last four years of your life have felt like 400, like they're never gonna end. Like the chaos and the pain and the turmoil, the brokenness, the loss is so immense, it's so heavy, it's so drastic, it feels like 400 years of silence from a God who they say loves you. For some of us in this room, the four weeks of December, when everyone all around us is walking around with holiday cheer, these four weeks feel like 400 years of pain and enslavement to our despair and to our loss because th- these four weeks in December remind you that life is not all well. Maybe the last four days have felt like 400 years because you didn't expect that relationship to end or that business to fail or your kids to rebel the way they have. You didn't expect that betrayal, the breaking of trust. You didn't expect that inner dark thing inside of you, that addiction or depression or pain. You didn't expect it to continue lingering for, for this long whether it's four days or four weeks or four years or 40 years or however long, sometimes it feels like 400. And just like God's people at the time of Jesus, we ask the question, is God still here? 
Does he still see me? Does he still care? Is his grace still upon me? Does he still have favor towards me? Am I still his? The story of Isaiah and the story of John the Baptist and the story of Christmas declare emphatically to you and to me and to every single one of us, yes, God still cares. He has not left you. He is still for you. He still loves you. His grace is still upon you. His favor is still with you. He has a plan for your life. And this life is not easy. And until the king returns to make all wrong things right, we will continue to live in the tension that Christmas happened once, but it will happen again. But in the in-between, while everything isn't perfect, you need to know that in your waiting, in your pain, in your longing, in your doubt, in your anxiety, in your fear, in your guilt, in your shame, God has not left you. He is still for you and he is still with you. The light of the world is closer than you think. A few weeks ago, my good friend Dave Tisch, um, who's on staff here, who was just up here a little while ago here at Saratoga campus, um, he texted me this photo. Uh, this is a photo <clears throat> from 1994, January of 1994. And shockingly enough, this is a photo of the Los Angeles skyline in January of 1994. This is in the morning of January 1994, a cold January morning in LA. And you will notice all the lights are off, which never happens in LA, which is the city of lights. Here's what happened. In January of 1994, the Northridge earthquake, a 6.7 magnitude earthquake, hit LA and it caused a citywide power outage. The entire city of Los Angeles, one of the brightest cities in the world, the city of lights, losing all of their light. A really fascinating thing happened that January morning as people woke up. 911 dispatched was inundated with phone calls. But here's what's surprising. People were not calling to say, my power is out and I need help. Most people were calling 911 that morning with things like, I think the aliens are invading. <laughs> Look up above, I think the spaceships are coming to destroy us all. It's Independence Day, where is Will Smith? Like that, that those were the nature of the phone calls. Why? Because residents of LA that morning looked up at, the, at the, uh, the dark pitch black sky and they saw this giant silvery cloud shining bright in the sky above. What they were looking at was the Milky Way that was always overhead above Los Angeles. They simply could not see because the lights of their city were too bright. In the great words of the great American theologian, Bruce Springsteen, they were blinded by the light. <laughs> and so are we. The light of the world hovers overhead closer than you think. The light of the world shines brightly all around you. But in order to see it, you have to begin to turn off the bright lights that you manufacture. The bright lights of your intellect and your ingenuity. The bright lights of your money and your resources. The bright lights of your, your achievements and your social status and your well thought out plans for life. All of the bright lights that you create in your life to shine ahead of you into the darkness so that you might see clearly and walk the path of peace to find unending joy. Those lights, I am telling you, will always fail you. And it is when and only when you turn off those lights 
eyes, that you will finally see that which so many cannot see, that there is only one light of the world that can shine brightly enough to drive out the darkness and even the shadow of death in our lives, in our world. The Prince of Peace who comes to lead us down the path of peace. There is only one king who is going to arrive to make all wrong things right, to heal the brokenness in our lives and in our world. And his name is Jesus. And if you would turn off the lights, you would see that which so many cannot see. And that's what Christmas is all about. To lift your gaze beyond the bright lights of culture and society and your own life to see the light of the world who has come and is coming again. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for coming and we thank you for the hope we have in your return. And while we wait in this tension, we ask that you would open our eyes, that you would open our hearts and our minds to see that which so many cannot see. You, king of the world, coming to bring peace and joy forever. You, the light of the world, ready to break into our darkness, to shine brightly and to guide us down the path of peace that leads to unending joy. Help us to see you clearly and to live our lives in such a way that we might help others see. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.